the shooting range. In this episode, the Japanese Stuka, or not, the fearsome Aichi D3N, the rise, fall, and rise of the BF-110, the story of the iconic two-engine heavy fighter. Hotline, the developers answer questions that you've left in the comments. But first, let's start with the bloody big ship. Let's try out a Fletcher-class destroyer. This is a yet another big ship that you'll be able to deploy in the upcoming naval battles. This design was generally regarded as highly successful, and small wonder, it's not just a reliable combat ship with a sturdy frame and big crew, it also has a hell of a fighter that comes to the battle, equipped with a wide array of armaments. Check this out. The Fletcher carries five 5-inch, 127mm guns, two 40mm bofors, and five 20mm Oilicon cannons. It also has 10 533mm torpedo tubes spread across two launches located midships. It's a real joy to see the torpedoes speeding fanwise toward an enemy ship. Boom! As you have no doubt guessed, approaching the destroyer and engaging it at close range is a very unthankful task, reaching speeds of 36 knots at 68 kilometers an hour. The Fletcher can easily dodge enemy torpedoes, and its massive guns allow it to one-shot any PT boat that gets too close. Another great thing is that you're constantly guarded from the attack coming from above. An army of AI gunners will make excellent use of your vast array of AA mounts, turning any approaching warbird, or at least most of them, into a pretty ball of flame. There are a few things worth keeping in mind. The destroyer takes some time to stop, quite a long time actually. It's a massive, heavy vessel, not a light and agile boat, so be careful. Plan the stops and turns in advance. You don't want to suffer the same fate as the Titanic, do you? When fighting enemy destroyers and shooting at transports, stick to AP shells. HE shells are great for dealing with everybody else. You don't need to blow the whole ship to smithereens to sink an enemy. It's enough to destroy a couple of neighboring hull sections. That's why it doesn't pay to spray the opponent with fire. Choose a specific target and then try to land all your hits there. Cover is your best friend. Lock onto a target, get behind a mountain or two, and fire away. You'll be well protected. And he, or she, will have a very bad time. A great arrangement, if you ask me. And the last thing, don't rush into the middle of the enemy formation. Even the smallest boats will make short work of you if you're too reckless. Stay safe. Up next is the story of an epic comeback. The single-engine fighter design had only one big flaw. Because of their limited fuel capacity and subsequently a restricted radius of action, planes of this type often couldn't escort the bombers the whole way to enemy positions and back. The solution was found very quickly, even before the end of the First World War, in fact. Independent of one another, the leading aircraft designers of the world came up with a grand idea of building a heavier twin-engine fighter that could keep up with its bomber brethren. During the 1930s, the emergence of the all-metal designs, as well as the innovation of more powerful engines, led to a boom in the production of twin-engine aircraft. The French had the magnificent Portes 630. The Poles built an impressive PZL-38 Wilk. A bit later, they were followed by the Japanese Ki-45, the British Westland Whirlwind, and the Soviet GR-1. In Germany, this niche was occupied by the newest aircraft designed by Willy Messerschmitt, the BF-110. Trying to get the best performance out of the design, the team behind the BF-110 strayed from the guidelines of the Ministry of Aviation. That didn't bode too well with the officials, and at some point the project was on the verge of closing. In the end, Willy Messerschmitt had to pull some strings, and the BF-110 was finally ordered into production, to enthusiastic applause from the top brass. Reichmarschall Hermann Göring was so confident in the merits of the BF-110 that he wanted to give it to all the elite units of the Luftwaffe. And the new heavy fighter didn't disappoint. It performed really well in the skies above France and Poland, but those were the skies where German pilots didn't meet 
with much resistance. When the Luftwaffe tried to achieve air superiority over the Royal Air Force during the Battle of Britain, the Germans were in for a nasty surprise. It turned out that the Bf 110, while having enough fuel to escort the bombers, didn't have the actual capability to fight British fighters. These tactical single-engine machines, that only had to get in the air and gain some altitude, proved to be significantly faster and more agile. That could be the end of the German twin-engine designs, but the German engineers weren't ready to give up yet. OK, so the Bf 110 wasn't a good close escort aircraft. Maybe it could make a better strike aircraft or even a bomber. The plane was in a very weird spot. Basically, it had to find itself a new role in the war. At some point, the modification went by the name of the Bf 110C6, got a 30mm Mk 101 cannon, which gave the team behind the Bf 110 an excellent idea. What if we develop it into a night fighter? So they did. The new, more powerful engines allowed for the installation of radar equipment, as well as a few even more advanced 30mm Mk 108 cannons. Make it even scarier with the addition of the Werfer Granat 42 missiles, and you get a very dangerous beast indeed. That's how the fighter that was almost discontinued to make room for the brand new Messerschmitt Me 210 suddenly got a second chance. In the end, the Bf 110 is remembered as a kind of flying paradox. It wasn't really good at what it was supposed to do when it was built, but it somehow managed to find itself a new job, a few of them in fact and turned out to be so good at them that it soldiered on almost to the end of the war and the arrival of the mighty Heinkel HE-219. Now, let's speak about the aircraft that cast terror into the hearts of people all across Asia. Japan produced the first ever monoplane naval fighter. Japan built a gigantic flying boat with an unbelievable compact radius. Japan is busy building aircraft carriers. All the warning bells were ringing, but the alarm fell on deaf ears. A few days prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor, the American press was still full of jabs at the incompetence of the Japanese military. Ah, uh, Japanese aircraft are unreliable. Ah, uh, the Japanese planes are 40. Japanese pilots lack the capability to recover from a dive. The brutal wake-up call happened on the 7th of December, 1941, at 7.48 a.m. Hawaiian time. Zero fighters flew over the air bases, spraying them with bullets. Torpedo bombers dropped their deadly load in the azure waters of Pearl Harbor. And up there, destroying target after target with ruthless efficiency, saw dozens and dozens of dive bombers. They looked almost familiar, like a relative to a certain infamous German plane that became a symbol of Blitzkrieg in Europe. Well, the HED-3A carrier-borne dive bomber actually had some shared ancestry with the fearsome Stuka. And with many other planes of the era, in a way, it incorporated a lot of the effective design choices used in a long list of prototypes and serial aircraft alike. In fact, the story of the D-3A started in Germany. A few designs competed for a chance to become a dive bomber of the Luftwaffe. In the end, Heinkel's aircraft lost to the Junker Ju-87. But Heinkel, being the sly dog he always was, managed to sell his HE-118 to the Japanese Imperial Navy. Japan didn't yet have any monoplane aircraft of this type, and Heinkel had some friends there, so it all went pretty smoothly. But the Japanese didn't want to settle for just copying German technologies. They had much bigger ambitions. Not to mention the fact that the Heinkel sold them a land-based airplane when they needed to carry a born one. Think about it. The Heinkel HE-118 came equipped with a Daimler-Benz DB600 liquid-cooled inverted V12 engine. Where to get all that fresh water for it when you're in the middle of the ocean? No, a naval bomber needed a powerful air-cooled radial engine. At the same time, the elliptical wing platform had to stay. It generated a lot of lift and allowed for a low stall speed. Just what the doctor ordered when you're building an aircraft that has to land on a carrier. But the design didn't really need an inverted gull wing, so that thing had to go. Now let's take a look at the undercarriage. The HE-118 had a rather traditional retractable landing gear which wasn't sturdy enough to survive rough landings on a carrier. The Japanese used this opportunity to learn a trick or two from the Junkers Ju-87 that was already flying in Spain. So the new aircraft got a fixed gear 
Add a dorsal fin strake, strengthen the hull structure, install an arresting gear, and that's it! You get your own flying terror, this time a carrier-borne one. Even the destiny of this aircraft is very reminiscent of what happened to the Stuka. The German dive bomber became a symbol of the German war machine, bringing death and despair to continental Europe, Britain and the Soviet Union. The D-3A followed the same path. These bombers brought destruction and chaos to China, the Philippines, Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. They were used to sink countless ships and destroy countless targets on the shore. But then came the reckoning. The Ju-87 and the D-3A seemed untouchable when coming from the position of superior strength. But both machines suddenly turned out to be quite vulnerable when meeting determined resistance. Stukas were dropping one after the other into the cold waters of the English Channel and exploding on the snowy fields of Russia. The D-3As became easy prey to American fighters. The remains of the Japanese bombers littered the ocean floor, first at Midway, then practically everywhere where they met American aircraft, and the Allied air strength kept on growing. Under the circumstances, there was no use in modernizing outdated dive bombers. Just like the Stuka, the D-3A didn't live to see the fall of the regime that created it. The Japanese bombers of this type were taken out of production in 1944. The last machines were used in suicide ramming attacks. <laughs> and soon, they were all gone. Get ready for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline. Developers answering questions from the comments. Strictly speaking, it's not the most serious-minded section of the show. If you want answers to be given with solemn faces, feel free to appeal to the official War Thunder forums. Here, we'll have a more light-hearted discussion of the big questions of War Thunder. The first message comes from a player called Nope, no name here. Would it be unrealistic to hope for a better interaction of tanks with terrain? For example, the possibility of getting stuck in the mud while going through some difficult terrain? That could force players to plan more and open for more strategies. Actually, the game already models several distinct terrain types. On different types of surfaces, vehicles behave in a different way. And, for instance, it's entirely possible to slow almost to a halt while wading through the mud. Do you want it to be even more punishing? Honest question. Then, there is a question from Vil Koestila. Will we have some kind of system to use with the Sturm Panzer II, the Su-5, and similar tanks as artillery, like they are supposed to be used? Good question. There are two things to consider here. A. We do not want to create any kind of arcade artillery sites or anything along these lines, mostly because we believe that it will only detract from the experience. A more serious, more realistic approach might work, though. B. There aren't that many vehicles that would benefit from such a system in the game right now. All in all, we're not planning to work on anything like that in the nearest future. Aussie we're away ass. Will we ever be able to have more Blenheim types in the future? Like the Mark 1 or the Mark 4F, the Night Fighter version? I like me Blenheims. The thing is, who doesn't? Hello, mate. It's not out of the question, but currently we have a lot of other things on our plate. Stay tuned. And the last very important message written by CA800 TCQ. Feel free to send us a new episode. We do watch them all, and you might see one of our comments in the next episode. Wait. What? Are we being used here? That's it for the day, folks. Feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all and... Oh, god damn it. Okay, just don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on the shooting range.